Overall, I'm Forum BX257, your friendly neighborhood 1980s G.I. Joe reviewer, and it's time to bid farewell to the old year. So goodbye 2018 and hello to 2019, but also hello to some brand new G.I. Joe collectors. And that's exactly what's inspired this top 10 list, because I repeatedly get questions about the availability and rarity of certain parts, and of course, the worry that some people will not be able to put together a vehicle because a part is just never going to be available. Now, this list is not comprehensive. It's not going to include store exclusives because those are altogether quite rare. Also, bear in mind that not all the vehicles with you know, a part missing is going to be extremely expensive or valuable on the aftermarket. And the same goes for that particular part. It might not be expensive, but it will be something which is very often lost or broken on a vehicle. First, I'll start with the honorable mention, as this covers a common type of part missing from many different vehicles, antennas. Often called the bane of G.I. Joe collectors, antennas are the easiest part to go missing or break. Some examples of the hardest antenna to find are ones from the 1989 Thunderclap, the two 1989 Cobra Battlefield Robots Devastator and Hovercraft, as well as the Joe Battlefield Robots Triblaster and Radar Rat, the 1990 Hammer, and 1990 General. All the antennas mentioned except the Generals are often found broken. The General is a special kind of cruel because while it is sturdy, there are two of them. Good luck with that. Now, in no particular order of rarity or value, number one on the list is the 1983 Wolverine Tow Cable. I suppose this also covers its mold reuses in the 1985 Mahler MBT and 1989 Slaughter's Marauders Equalizer and Lynx. Like an antenna, the tow cable is ridiculously long and thin plastic, but unlike an antenna, it was meant to be stretched over two pegs at either of its ends and taken out and used to pull another vehicle. No wonder these things never survived. For reference, the Wolverine cable is light grey, the Mauler's is dark grey, and the two Slaughter's Marauders cables are a medium grey. They are all pretty high on most collector's wish lists and command a decent aftermarket value. Number two on the list is the 1985 USS Flag Stern Rail. While the item seems sturdy and pegs into place fine, it has a unique reason it goes missing. You see, most vehicle parts have to be assembled by removing them from sprues or plastic trees. And what does the rail look like without context? That's right, most kids or adults back in the day already tired of handling 100 tiny pieces would have accidentally thrown this out with the rest of the empty sprues. This part may command the highest aftermarket value of anything I'll list, but there is a silver lining. There are good reproductions available. However, if you're trying to determine if you have an original or a recent repro, color match it to the radar dish in your antennas, assuming those aren't missing too. Third on the list is the 1984 Killer Whale Hovercraft Fan Vanes. Another example of thin plastic being used for a part that is meant to be moved, the fan vanes have many breaking points. The vanes are a multi-piece affair held on to the fan rings by what is possibly the tiniest, most breakable pegs. Attached to the vane is the horizontal direction flap, held on by the two thinnest struts that are somehow meant to be bent, simulating the vanes turning without snapping off. Below them are more tiny breakable pegs holding on the brace that connects one vane to another, simulating the flaps being turned in unison. But then add to the fact that each of the two fans has two of these vanes and you're likely missing four of these devils. Like the USS Flag Stern Rail, however, there are good reproductions out there. Sadly, this isn't the only breakable thing on the Killer Whale, but I covered that in more detail on my recent review. Number four on the list is an odd one. It's the umbilical cord from the 1987 Defiant Space Shuttle Launch Complex and also from the 1989 Crusader Shuttle. This is an item meant to attach the figure's space backpack and either the shuttle or the space station for EVA. I call it an odd one simply because this thick plastic copper coated wire can be replaced with a 14 inch length of 10 gauge wire you can buy today at the hardware store. 
The only difficulty in replicating the original look is getting rid of the information printed on the wire's casing. This is something I have done successfully with a bit of Goo Gone, a light paint and glue remover. I'm told rubbing alcohol also works fine too. I have seen some early versions of the original wire with unique plastic end caps, but most of these were issued with cut ends that which appear to have been sanded flat. While this replacement is no secret, most Defiance and Crusaders being sold on the aftermarket don't come with the original. You can imagine a played with original copper wire becoming floppy really quickly and being discarded. Don't pay collector prices unless you can confirm that the wire came from a sealed package or has the rare plastic end caps. Fifth on the list is an item slowly gaining value on the aftermarket. The two flags from the 1986 Cobra Stun. Like antenna, it's long thin pieces of plastic, already a recipe for disaster. And there's two of these flags per vehicle, but there's an extra problem thrown into the mix. The bad quality of the red plastic parts for this toy. This isn't a result of the plastic just aging normally, as the stun's black and grey plastic parts are as solid as the day they came from the factory. All the red plastic parts, regardless of thickness, are subject to breaking easily, like Transformers Gold Plastic Syndrome, but can be fixed as they mostly break at hidden pegs. But you really can't repair the exposed flag folds without it being obvious, and that's assuming you even find them at all. Oddly enough, the 1989 Python Patrol version of the stun doesn't suffer from this, but then again, it's made out of yellow plastic. Number 6 is the roll cage on the back of the 1983 Cobra Fang helicopter. Here's a confirmed case of an item breaking while being assembled back in the day by its original owners. The little cage was meant to stretch around the jet thruster while simultaneously being pegged in at both ends with pegs that needed to be squeezed from different angles. What the heck was Hasbro thinking when they designed this method of attachment? Maybe it would have been possible with a softer or rubbery plastic, but this piece is as stiff as the rest of the fan components. I did a repair video on the rotor for this vehicle, another common failure point, but that ends up being a non-stressed hidden fix. How are you supposed to fix unstretchable plastic that needs to stretch? I'm told that later versions of the mold enlarge the holes that the cage fits into, but that just creates a new problem, an easily lost cage due to it falling out. This is such a classic vehicle that for years collectors found creative ways of replacing this part, though not often replicating it. Seventh on the list is a part of a vehicle I just finished reviewing, the missile launcher from the 1991 Cobra Ice Saber. While all the blue plastic parts of the vehicle are extremely fragile, like the 1986 stun red plastic, most are not meant for heavy stresses. That's not true of the missile launcher, however. It's connected to the vehicle by a bar and arms that are meant to slip under, then squeeze back up into place. If that doesn't break the missile launcher connection, then the tight tines that hold them in place might when you try to pivot it up or down. Add to this that the real spring-loaded missiles need the launcher to be rather unintuitively cocked before insertion, and that's just more stress a kid is placing on this one component. An ice saber on the aftermarket with a working intact launcher isn't worth much, but is definitely rare. Number 8 is the steering wheel for the 1984 Vamp Mark II, and the 1984 Cobra Stinger which shared its mold. Unlike many steering wheel designs before and after, the Vamp Mark II is a simple peg on the dashboard and hole in the steering column. Normally, G.I. Joe toy steering wheels end in a keyed peg which lock it into the dashboard, presumably forever. However, here is a part that not only pops out easily, it's encouraged that a figure's tight grip is placed on it while squeezing that figure into and out of the cabin. Early versions of the dashboard didn't even have a peg but a shallow rim that the steering wheels column fit into. This all creates many opportunities for it to fall out, and they did. Oddly enough, an intact Vamp Mark II and Stinger are relatively popular and moderately valued toys on the aftermarket, yet the hard-to-find steering wheels don't go for much more than a missile or a cabin panel. I guess that's some good news. Ninth on the list are the seat belts for the 1983 APC. I'll be honest and say I don't really understand how these big things end up going missing on a vehicle as the amphibious personnel carrier is supposed to double as an action figure carrier case. The bumper extends into a handle. The seat belts were necessary for keeping 16 of the 28 figures in place. 
Sure, they were long, thin pieces of plastic, but I have never encountered a broken set, so surely that's not why they disappeared. Did kids shelve or discard them to aid them in easier insertion and removal of the figures from the seats? They don't seem too clumsy to my adult hands, so maybe that's not it. Whatever the case may be, an APC is pretty common on the aftermarket, but those seatbelts really drive the price up. Get it? Drive? Because, uh, uh, never mind. The tenth and final rare vehicle part on my list of collector frustration is the searchlight lens for the 1985 Cobra Moray Hydrofoil. Unlike a lot of other rare parts on this list, if it's missing from the Moray, you might not even know it. This small clear lens with refractory detail is less than the size of a dime. It friction fits into a shallow groove on the searchlight, which itself has detail inside, making it understandable that collectors unfamiliar with every piece might not think that anything is supposed to cover that up. I'm not sure if it was easy to fall out or hard to install, or was just a small part missed on the sprue tree and accidentally thrown out. But one thing is certain, it's a rare part to find on the aftermarket and makes a popular classic vehicle quite valuable when described as 100% complete. One of the best pieces of advice I can give to a new collector beginning to reconstruct a toy from parts is to research what parts are common on the aftermarket. As this list is not comprehensive in any way, there are still a ton of parts that are hard to find not mentioned here. So also, make a note of what parts don't pop up often, so when they do appear, you can prioritize their purchase over parts that are more common. I hope this video has been interesting and helpful, and have a happy new year, G.I. Joe collectors!